Hi everybody, it's Dr. Patricia Coughlin, and I wanted to talk to you today about the dangers of pathologizing patients. I studied with Habib Davenlu, who developed ISTDP, and he abandoned the medical model and basically a pathology model, defining people by their problems, and instead adopted a potential model, right? That every human being has the potential to be whole, to heal, um, and to become, sorry, I've been outside gardening, um, you know, to become uh, their healthiest, best self. And so ISTDP really was founded on those principles. And he would speak to the highest level of the patient's capacity. And that's what he would align with and work with that healthy part of the patient to address the broken part. And this was very powerful. So he didn't confuse the person's defenses with who they are, right? So he wouldn't label people um, as a depressive, a borderline. Um, and again, that has a powerful impact. If you're seeing people's capacity, if you're assessing not just their problems and difficulties, but their strengths and capacities, and you align with and work at their highest level of capacity, right, you're gonna get some pretty dramatic movement. And I remember literally in the first year of practicing ISTDP, um, I saw a woman who had to this day the most horrendous abuse history I have ever encountered. And she had horrific migraines uh, four to five times a week for decades, um, tended to dissociate quite frequently. Um, so if you just looked at those defenses, right, um, and those symptoms, and you defined her that way, you'd think she's incredibly fragile, um, it's gonna take a long time. Um, but I noticed she had incredible resilience and terrific capacity. And so I spoke to that and I created an alliance with the healthiest part of her so that together we could look at all of the terrifying, anxiety-provoking um, feelings of retaliatory rage and, and pain that she had. And much to my surprise, um, she healed in 14 sessions, and I have 30-year follow-up on her. So this really matters. And I'm very concerned that not just in ISTDP, but in our field in general, I'm a psychologist and psychology started out as the study of human flourishing. Um, and yet after World War II, uh, when we had all the guys coming back with shell shock, we called it at that time, psychologists really started to um, get involved clinically in treating patients and sort of drifted, right, from that study of resilience and capacity to pathology. And I really see that happening um, currently. And so therapists are focusing excessively on the patient's problems, uh, deficits, defenses, and they're actually engaging at the patient's lowest level of capacity. So if they say, I think you're judging me, right? That's somehow seen as a capital P projection. Uh, the person's labeled as fragile and all kinds of perhaps unnecessary work is being done, which greatly extends the length of treatment. Instead of speaking to the health and capacity of that patient, to address that and to move rapidly. And so the same thing is true with anxiety assessment. If a patient gets dizzy or says that 
uh, suddenly the vision uh, is getting a bit fuzzy. Um, I see therapists just putting on the brakes, um, assuming that the patient has a fragile ego structure and really uh, slowing down the process and not understanding, right, or putting together a complex picture that this person might have gone over the threshold of anxiety and gotten dizzy, uh, but with intervention, they can come back to clarity and 60 seconds and you can proceed. You don't have to flatline. And so it's a huge concern um, that having this pathological focus and focusing excessively on what's wrong and what's missing is really contributing to um, longer and longer treatments of less and less efficiency and effectiveness. And this sort of therapeutic perspective is bleeding out into the larger culture. And we're seeing that our children in particular are suffering from more mental health symptoms and crises than ever before. And why is that? How are we contributing to that? We know that from 1980 to 2010, the rate of narcissism in college freshmen increased by 30%. And I think that was that we in our, the therapeutic community um, actually inadvertently supported that with this excessive focus on the self, um, what you feel, what you want, um, alone without also understanding and being concerned about the needs of others. Um, and now we are creating an entire generation of fragile children who can't live in the world on life's terms. Instead of building resilience, we're coddling children and creating weakness and fragility. And there are some really outstanding books on this phenomenon, what a crisis it is and how we really have to change course. Uh, the coddling of the American mind is one. Bad therapy is another. And most recently, Haight's new book, The Anxious Generation. Um, so I would really urge you to check yourself on this. Are you engaging with the weakest part of the person and focusing excessively on problems and symptoms? Or are you equally attentive to the person's strengths and capacities, their resilience and flexibility? And is that the part you're aligned with, partnering with to address the difficulties? Um, again, I think we have to look at ourselves and how this therapeutic uh, approach, which again has bled into the whole culture, is really having a very deleterious effect. And I know that the great majority of therapists out there practicing now have a master's degree. Um, they are not trained in the scientific method and are not familiar with the research and don't make it a habit to keep up with the research. Um, I subscribe to and read several journals a month. It's really something that I think every therapist uh, responsibly needs to do to keep up with the research. It's not enough to know theory and practice. You have to check that out with the research. Are our theoretical assumptions and our therapeutic approaches actually getting supported or refuted by research? If you remember, uh, gosh, I don't know, maybe it was in the 80s or 90s when uh, we mistakenly thought the way to build children's self-esteem is just to tell them they're fabulous at all times um, and everybody gets stars and everybody gets a trophy. Um, and this has been disastrous. Um, children know they didn't earn it, don't deserve it. Uh, they know who you know the top students are or the best athletes. And in fact, what's true is that instead of um, speaking to what are fixed traits, like you're so smart, you're so beautiful, um, you know, those are givens. It's nothing the person earned, right? That was their genetic inheritance. You want to focus on 
and emphasize and reinforce things that are variable and in the child's um, sphere of control, like effort and persistence. So what we thought was a really good idea, which is just to cheerlead the kids and tell them that they're great, um, actually ended up undermining their self-esteem. And we found this out through research, so then we have to change, right? And make sure that we're focusing on those variable uh, traits like effort and persistence, right? And the same is true with all of these other issues. And so I really urge you all to keep up on research, um, read books, and read journals, right, every month, right? So that you have some scientific backing for what you're doing. So uh, I hope this is inspirational and um, that you'll really think uh, about your own stance here and the importance of having a potential rather than pathological view of the patient. Thanks. Bye-bye.